Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a nice glass of sangria. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a hard apple cider, and on this week's episode, we will be looking at the events surrounding the death of Breonna Taylor. This case shocked the country and made people question the tactics used by police, specifically no-knock warrant. Many people have cited this case when discussing necessary reforms to police procedures and how grand juries evaluate the evidence presented to them by prosecutors. The events that led to Taylor's death started with the police's pursuit of Jamarcus Glover and Adrian Walker. They were suspected of selling drugs in a house about 10 miles away from Brianna's residence. Taylor and Grover were in a relationship from 2014 to February of 2020, and Glover lived at Brianna's apartment but moved out due to outside pressures, according to his statements. Brianna started dating Kenneth Walker, and he moved into the apartment with Brianna. The Louisville Metro Police Department obtained a no-knock warrant for Brianna Taylor's apartment due to their suspicions that Glover received packages containing drugs there, and because he might have been keeping narcotics and or proceeds from the sale of narcotics at Brianna's apartment. Specifically, the warrant alleges that in January of 2020, Glover left Taylor's apartment with an unknown packet presumed to contain drugs and took it to a known drug apartment soon afterward. The warrant states that this event was verified, quote, through a U.S. postal inspector, end quote. In May 2020, the U.S. Postal Inspector in Louisville publicly announced that the collaboration with law enforcement had never actually occurred. The Postal Office said it was actually asked by a different agency to monitor packages going to Taylor's apartment, but after doing so, it concluded, quote, there's no package of interest going there, end quote. The warrant for Brianna's apartment was applied for by LMPD Detective Joshua James, among a total of five warrants approved the preceding day by Jefferson County Circuit Judge Mary M. Shaw within 12 minutes and which was stamped as filed with the court clerk's office on April 2nd. All five warrants contained similar language involving a justification for a no-knock entry that concludes with, quote, due to the nature of how these drug traffickers operate, end quote. Detective James attested in the affidavit that he verified through the U.S. Postal Inspector that Jamarcus Glover had been receiving packages at 3003 Springfield Drive, apartment number 4. James knows through training and experience that it is not uncommon for drug traffickers to receive mail packages at different locations to avoid detection from law enforcement. He believes through training and experience that Mr. J. Glover may be keeping narcotics and or proceeds from the sale of narcotics at 3003 Springfield Drive, apartment 4, for safekeeping. Sergeant Timothy Salyer, supervisor of the Shively, Kentucky Police Department's Special Investigations Unit, told LMPD internal investigators in May that due to, quote, bad blood, end quote, between the United States Postal Inspection Service and the LMPD, inquiries related to the drug trafficking investigation had been rooted through the Shively Police Department. In his interview with internal investigations, Jaynes said that before the raid on Taylor's apartment, Mattingly told him, that the Shively Police Department had reported that the United States Postal Service had not delivered any suspicious packages to that address. Jaynes had reassigned from his duties with the LMPD in June. According to the New York Times, before the execution of the no-knock warrant, orders were changed to quote-unquote knock and announce. Shortly after midnight on March 13, 2020, Louisville police dressed in plain clothes knocked on Taylor's door before forcing entry using a battering ram. The main officers involved were Jonathan Mattingly, Brett Hankison, and Miles Cosgrove. There is a dispute as to whether the police announced themselves before entering. According to all the witnesses except for one, the police did not announce themselves. One witness was outside smoking a cigarette in clear eyeshot and heard nothing but the police breaking down Taylor's door. 
Even the one witness that claimed to hear the police announce later clarified through his lawyer that the police only announced themselves, quote unquote, in passing. According to Vice News, the witness originally said, quote, nobody identified themselves, end quote, when interviewed by police a week after the shooting. But when the police called him two months later, he said he heard, quote, this is the cops, end quote. When the police battery rammed the door, Kenneth Walker, believing that someone was breaking into the home, fired a warning shot. According to officials, the shot struck Mattingly in the leg, but like many situations in this case, the officials may not be telling the whole story. Walker's legal team asserts that because forensic photography shows no blood in the part of the apartment where Mattingly says he was shot, because a court-sealed photograph of the single hollow point bullet from Walker's firearm shows no blood, and because based on consultations with pathologists, they believe that a hollow point bullet would have done, quote-unquote, considerably more damage to Mattingly's thigh. The evidence suggests Mattingly was shot by police officers. A Kentucky State Police ballistics report is inconclusive, saying that, quote, due to limited markings of comparative value, end quote, the bullet that hit Mattingly and exited his thigh was neither, quote, identified nor eliminated as having been fired, end quote, from Walker's gun. It was fired from a 9mm pistol like Walker's, whereas all officers were carrying 40 caliber guns. The officers returned fire and fired 32 bullets into the apartment during two flurries of about 1 minute and 8 seconds. Mattingly, who was the only officer to enter into the apartment, fired 6 shots. Cosgrove fired 16 shots from the doorway. Hackinson fired 16 shots from outside of the apartment through a sliding door that was covered by blinds and curtains. Hackinson's bullets hit a neighboring apartment. Taylor was shot by five bullets and was killed in the hallway by a bullet fired by Cosgrave. Brianna Taylor was pronounced dead at the scene at the age of 26. Despite the amount of bullets and being right next to her, Kenneth was uninjured. According to police grand jury testimony, the warrant was never executed and Taylor's apartment was not searched for drugs or money after the shooting. More than a month after the shooting, Glover was offered a plea deal if he would testify that Taylor was a part of his drug dealing operation. Prosecutors said that the offer was in a draft of a deal but later removed. Glover rejected the deal. An autopsy was conducted on Taylor and her cause of death was determined to be a homicide. The death certificate also notes that she received five gunshot wounds to the body. The Courier's Journal request for a copy of the autopsy. As of July 17, 2020, the newspaper was appealing to the Attorney General's office. The police filed an incident report that claimed that Taylor had no injuries and that no forced entry occurred. The police department said that technical errors led to a nearly entirely blank, malformed report. All three officers involved in the shooting were placed on administrative reassignment pending the outcome of, of an investigation by the police's Internal Professional Integrity Unit. On May 20th, 2020, the investigation's findings were given to the Attorney General of Kentucky, Daniel Cameron, to determine whether any officers should be criminally charged. Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher also asked the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office to review the findings. In early June, Fisher called for Officer Hackinson to be removed from the Louisville Police Merit Board, which reviews appeals from police officers in departmental disciplinary matters. Hackinson was one of five members of the board, which consisted of three civilians and two police officers selected by the River City Fraternal Order of Police. On June 19th, three months after Taylor's killing, Louisville Metro Police Interim Chief Robert Schroeder sent Hankison a letter notifying him that Schroeder had begun termination proceedings against him. The letter accused Hankison of violating departmental policies on the use of deadly force by, quote, wantonly and blindly, end quote, firing into Taylor's apartment without determining whether any person presented, quote unquote, an immediate threat or whether there were any, quote, innocent persons present, end quote. The letter also cited past disciplinary action taken against Hankison by the department, including reckless conduct. 
Hankison was formally fired four days later on June 23rd. He had 10 days until July 3rd to appeal his termination to the Louisville Police Merit Board. That appeal was delayed until the criminal investigation was finished. On September 23rd, 2020, a state grand jury indicted Hankison on three counts of wanton endangerment for endangering a neighboring white family of three when shots he fired penetrated their apartment. Neither Hankison nor the two other officers involved in the raid were indicted for Taylor's death. The Louisville Courier-Journal raised questions about whether the grand jury had been allowed to decide whether charges should be pressed against Mattingly and Cosgrove, or whether prosecutors decided that the officers acted in self-defense without submitting the issue to the grand jury. Walker's attorneys requested the release of the grand jury transcript and related evidence. On September 28th, a grand jury filed a court motion stating that Cameron had mischaracterized the grand jury proceedings and was, quote, using grand jurors as a shield to deflect accountability and responsibility, end quote, for charging decisions. A judge ordered the release of the grand jury proceedings recording. Cameron's office and Hankison's attorney opposed the ruling. A day later, Cameron said he did not recommend murder charges to the grand jury, but maintained that he presented a, quote, thorough and complete case, end quote. While recordings of testimony and some other parts of the proceedings were released, the juror deliberations and prosecutor recommendations were not released, and according to the state attorney general's office, were never recorded. Kenneth Walker was initially charged with first-degree assault and attempted murder of a police officer. The LMPD maintained that they announced themselves and that Walker fired to prevent the entry of police officers into the apartment. Walker had from the beginning stated that he believed that someone was breaking in and that he never heard officers announce themselves. A 911 call that was released later confirms this belief with Walker stating, quote, someone just shot my girlfriend, end quote. ADA Tom Wine moved to have all charges dismissed against Walker based on the results of the FBI and Kentucky State Attorney General's Office investigation. On May 26, 2020, Judge Alou Stevens granted Wine's motion to drop all charges against Walker. Walker's attorney filed the motion to have the charges permanently dismissed since the original dismissal left the door open for future charges. This motion asked for immunity based on Kentucky Stand Your Ground laws. This motion was granted in March of 2021. The family of Breonna Taylor filed a wrongful death suit against the Louisville Metro government, which oversees the police department, and the case was settled for $12 million. The LMG admitted no wrongdoing or liability on their part or the part of the police department. They were also absolved of any responsibility for any expenses related to Taylor's death, and the Taylor family was not prevented from suing the city of Louisville. The city agreed to initiate a housing credits program for police officers to live in the Louisville metro area, a fundamental community policing measure, instituting policing changes requiring more oversight by top commanders, and making mandatory safeguards that were only quote-unquote common practice before the raid. The LMPD now requires body cams for all of their officers, and Mayor Fisher suspended the use of no-knock warrant. On January 6, 2021, the LMPD fired Cosgrave, the officer who shot and killed Taylor, and Jane, the officer who obtained the warrant for the raid. I think the housing credit thing is kind of interesting. Like, I know that people always say how it is better for police officers to live in the community that they're policing, but it would be kind of nice for a housing credit for, like, other people. Because housing is such an issue across our country. Right, and I agree with you. I definitely think that if we can have police officers more involved in the community, like living there, is definitely something important. And the fact that they're incentivizing it is a step in the right direction. One thing that caused controversy in the case was the officer's use of a no-knock warrant. A no-knock warrant is a search warrant authorizing police officers to enter certain premises without first knocking and announcing their presence or purpose prior to entering the premises. Such warrants are issued where an entry pursuant to the knock and announce rule 
i.e. an announcement prior to entry, would lead to the destruction of the objects for which the police are searching or would compromise the safety of the police or another individual. This case was the first time I had actually ever heard of no-knock warrants, and I think they have the potential to be very dangerous. I think they should only be used in extreme cases like kidnappings, terrorism, or if someone is an immediate threat. Even then, there's a lot of potential to go wrong and end with someone being injured or with their rights taken away somehow. You can look this up, but Brianna isn't the only person that has died during a no-knock warrant. There's a lot that can go wrong, and we've seen innocent people's homes get destroyed, innocent people that have to get on the ground because the police are there because they got the wrong address. And there's videos of stuff like this too, and they're very scary. I don't know if you've seen any videos of no-knock warrants. Have you, Del? I actually have, unfortunately. And a lot of times what stands out is the surprise on the people's face because they have no idea what's going on. In some of the videos I've seen, there are children in the houses too, and it's so hard to hear them scream and to see an adult try to hold them and comfort them. I can't even imagine the trauma that everyone involved in that has to experience, even if you know they are with someone that's breaking the law. That's still a really scary thing to witness. But going back to when the police get it wrong, I don't know if it's error or just incompetence or what it is, but it seems to happen a lot. And frankly, I don't trust the police to execute these properly or be held accountable when they make these mistakes. And to me, it really gives them more power, which I don't think that the police need. I think the fact that no-knock warrants are getting banned in many places across the country or they're getting restricted to only be allowed in extreme cases says a lot about how necessary and helpful that they really are. What are your thoughts on all that? I absolutely agree with you. I think no-knock warrants should be used in very limited and hyper-tailored to the specific situation. I do see the benefits of it, but I think that there needs to be clear evidence presented that destruction of evidence will happen if the police were to announce their presence. For example, the person has destroyed evidence before. For example, the person has taken a hostage. They have harmed someone if the police came around. This standard of a police's gut being enough is ridiculous to me. I don't think that we should be staking someone's constitutional rights on the whims of one individual. And that's what we're doing now. We're having one individual go to the courthouse and say, I have a feeling that this person is going to destroy evidence. And that's enough for a judge to say, well, the constitution doesn't matter. Let's go break down someone's door. And I just don't think that's right. No, absolutely not. And as you were saying that, it made me think, We've all seen cop shows or cop movies and there's always, you know, some inexperienced cop or some cop that's like on, you know, living on the edge and they always say, you know, I have a hunch, I think it's this person and then their supervisor doesn't believe them and then it turns out they were right. I think that kind of stuff is really put in place so we trust the police and we really, you know, uphold every single thing that, that they do and I don't think we should be doing that. They are people that can make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but there's really terrible consequences sometimes when police make mistakes and people die, unfortunately. Absolutely. And I think that one thing that police officers in this context get compared to is doctors. When doctors make mistakes, when doctors kill people, it is a strong consequence. It's not that their job is stressful, they're dealing with a bunch of people, you never know what happens. It's you killed someone, you now have to face the consequences of that action. And I feel like accountability for police, while it's a lot better now than it has been in the past, I don't think that we're really there yet. You have things like qualified immunity, where you can't even sue an officer that has done you wrong, like you can sue a cop, like you can sue a lawyer. I think that maybe we should have a similar system that we have with doctors where police officers have to pay into some type of malpractice insurance, where if they do something wrong, a victim can file a claim against their insurance company 
if you get a claim filed against you, your premiums go up. And I think that will incentivize officers to be careful with their use of excessive force and definitely be very careful when firing their weapon. I am not someone who thinks that there is no reason for an officer to carry a gun. I do think that it's very necessary for all police officers to have them, but they need to be very diligent in their use of weapons and in their use of warrants, especially no-knock warrants. That's such a creative solution. I would never really think to do that. I wonder if something like that isn't stated because officers deal with the public so much that anyone could just come out of the woodwork and say, they did this to me and I didn't like that. Something like that in place would definitely hold them accountable and that's clearly what we need right now, officers to be held accountable. I think qualified immunity is bullshit in all honesty. What other profession is like that? Why do we just trust every single thing that a police officer does? Even before, you know, we really were having this movement against police violence in the past decade or so, we've known that cops can be crooked, doctors can be crooked, teachers can be crooked. We all know that. But like you said, Del, if a doctor messes with you somehow, messes you up in your surgery, you can sue them. There are rules to keep that doctor away from people. So something else that many people have debated is whether Kentucky's stand your ground laws should be used in this case in regards to Kenneth Walker's firing of his weapon at police officers. Stand your ground laws are also known as the Castle Doctrine. It is the common law principle that states individuals have the right to use reasonable force, including deadly force, to protect themselves or others against an intruder in their home. Stand your ground states typically go further and say that there is no duty to retreat or use less lethal options first. Me and Jenny, we live in New Jersey. New Jersey is not a stand your ground state. If you're in New Jersey and someone is breaking into your front door and you have a back door, the expectation is you try to escape before you try to fight. But obviously this case is taking place in Kentucky and Kentucky, like other states, including Texas and Florida, they have law to say that if someone breaks into your home and a lot of times that protection expands beyond the home to any place where you have a legal right to be. So whether that be a restaurant, whether that be a school, whether that be outside, such as is the case with George Zimmerman. As long as you have a right to be somewhere, it seems like you can defend yourself in any way you see fit. So, Jenny... Do you think that stand your ground laws are necessary? I would generally say no, because I think it did work in Kenneth Walker's favor because he literally had no idea who was at the door. And obviously, if you feel like you're in danger and truly your only way out is to hurt or kill someone, I can understand that. But I think one of the biggest issues with the stand your ground law is that it's hard to tell when reasonable force is necessary and when someone truly is fearing for their life. It can be a very confusing thing and it's too much of a gray area. And what you just said that some of the states, they go further and there's no duty to retreat or use less deadly options first. I feel like that's always what it should be. If you can get away or if there's something less deadly you can do, like I don't know, even firing a warning shot or you can even lie and say you have a gun or, you know, say I've already called the police. I know that's something that they tell you to say if you feel like you're in danger. Something I did want to mention about the stand your ground laws is they've gotten a lot of criticism because of potentially racist consequences of the law, I guess you could say. There's, I guess, conflicting statistics, but some people say that The defense doesn't work as often for black and brown people as it does for white people. And some people straight up see it as an excuse to kill black and brown people because, you know, our society does view them as more violent, more threatening people. Whenever I think of Sanyar Grant, I think of George Zimmerman, though, like you said, Del, and how the 911 operators told him to go back, stop what you're doing and leave this kid alone. And he kept going for it. So whenever I think of staying your ground, it always just feels very unnecessary to me. So I think that staying your ground laws are one of those tricky subjects because 
on one hand, I believe that people should have the ability to defend themselves, defend others, and defend their property. However, I do think that if you can not kill a person in a situation, then that is what you should go for. That should be the goal that you're trying to achieve. And I think that in a lot of places, stand your ground laws eliminate that. People know that they can go for the deadliest option, so that's where they go. So the Breonna Taylor case has been used as one of the examples of the mistreatment of minority individuals by police officers. The Black Lives Matter movement was started as a result of the supposed danger that Black individuals face in America. BLM has claimed that America is not welcoming of Black people and that all Black people's lives are not valued by the wider society. Just to give you a bit more background on Black Lives Matter, it is an activist movement which began as a hashtag when in July of 2013, George Zimmerman was acquitted in the shooting death of Trayvon Martin. It was started by three Black community organizers, Patrice Kahn Collars, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tamidi. The Black Lives Matter movement became more widely acknowledged and popularized after two high-profile deaths of unarmed African-American men, Eric Gardner in Staten Island, New York, and Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, in which the police officers involved in their deaths were not indicted. According to Black Lives Matter, the name signals condemnation of the killings of Black people by police and the demand that society value the lives and humanity of Black people as much as it values the lives and humanity of white people. BLM activists protested the deaths at the hands of police or while in police custody of several other Black people, including Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Freddie Gray, Laquan McDonald, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Alton Sterling, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Dante Wright. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? I support BLM. I support their core messages, and I think they've done a lot of really important work in the past almost decade that has caused a lot of people to think differently and change their behavior, particularly around police violence. And I think it's work that's long needed to be done. And the organization was formed in response to just a legacy of racism and white supremacy in America. I think their message gets easily misconstrued and they get vilified a lot as some evil organization that just causes violence everywhere and that's really not true. 93% of the protests last year were peaceful protests and I think the police are using a lot more force than necessary during these protests, and that can sometimes cause this chaos that is talked about a lot to erupt. To me, when Black Lives Matter marches and protests, they are simply asking for Black Americans to be seen, heard, and protected. I believe that as a whole, it does more harm than good. Of course, the vast majority of America believes Black Lives Matter. There are bad parties within America, like the alt-right, that don't, but they don't represent all of America, or even most of it. As a Black America, it's disheartening to be reduced down to my skin color and told this lie that this country and its people see me as a threat. I know it's not true. I know that America is a place for all, and Black Lives Matter, they seem like they don't agree with that statement. I think that the most concerning thing about Black Lives Matter is its relationship with Antifa. This association has caused many problems because what could have been very peaceful protests for racial justice turns into riots that cause harm to people and destroy businesses. While I don't think that all lives matter as a counter is beneficial or productive for a meaningful conversation, I think that the underlying message is that America loves all people of all races. America is not defined by the bad actions of a very tiny fraction within it. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the case of Breonna Taylor. Make sure you click the subscribe button. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube every Wednesday with a new episode. Follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you can give. This is Jenny and Dal signing off. Stay safe.